Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. We're delighted to have you here again for our monthly breakfast. Today is our 248th breakfast since 9-11 when I started these breakfasts and since 2007. Um, the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York has been co-sponsoring these breakfasts with the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm Maria Volpe and I am a professor at John Jay where I also direct the dispute resolution program. These breakfasts would not be possible each month if it wasn't for a wonderful team of colleagues that I work with including Julie Denny, Chuck Newman, Matthew Latimer, Nikki Borofsky, and Emily Skinner. These breakfasts are recorded and the recordings are posted at www.acrgny.org. Uh, on the left-hand sidebar, you'll see videos. You can see all the videos since uh, April 2020, when we pivoted from the in-person version, we used to meet at John Jay. Um, and starting in April, we've been doing these online. So all the online uh, recordings are available um, at the ACRGMY website and soon on the CUNY DRC website where we're doing our website. I am so delighted that uh, we have two wonderful colleagues with us here this morning to share with us some of their thinking around a very timely topic. And I will let them uh, share all the details. I've known Sharon all of my life, Sharon Press. Uh, we served together on uh, what was then the precursor to ACR, the uh, organization known as spider, which now probably is not part of anyone's lexicon anymore. We just always have to uh, share what that stood for back then. And for sure now it was the Society of Professionals in Dispute Resolution. But very fond memories of all those uh, many, many, many hours when it felt like we were really trailblazing back then, uh, especially around issues involving youth and young people. Uh, in the field and what we would do to integrate a whole new group of, of uh, colleagues known as the young people. Um, happy some of those concerns are behind us. Uh, yes, they can be part of the field. In fact, a key part of the field now that we see peer mediation programs in schools, but that was pretty alien back then. So without any further ado, I am going to first turn this over to Emily Skinner, who is going to um, share just a, a few words from the co-sponsor, uh, ACRGNY, and then we'll turn it over to Julie, who will officially introduce our speakers this morning. Emily? Thank you, Maria. Uh, good morning or good afternoon for everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Skinner. I'm the president-elect at uh, the Association for Conflict Resolution Greater New York. And I uh, wanted to take a minute to let you know that registration is now open for our virtual conference this year, which will take place May 31st to June 3rd. Um, our theme this year is People in Practice, the Many Faces of Conflict Resolution, where we're really going to be looking at you know, the spectrum of ADR um, and the different spaces that, you know, um, we take up in our societies and our communities. Uh, we will have an in-person event this year for our kickoff with our honorees on May 31st, um, but the, June 1st through June 3rd will be virtual and we'll also have virtual networking events, um, lunchtime series, uh, speaker series, including um, ombudsman from the United Nations and also uh, other, um, uh, Danielle Sered from Common Justice. So it's going to be a really packed uh, and great schedule. And so I uh, wanted, I'll put the link into the chat and I look forward to seeing you guys not only at the breakfast next month, but also at the conference. Thank you, Emily. And now to Julie, who will introduce our speakers. Well, as Maria said, Sharon Press and I also go back a long time. Um, both our speakers today have 
very impressive credentials. In the interest of time, I'm going to truncate them, but trust me, the list is long. Sharon Press is the director of the Dispute Resolution Institute and professor of law at Mitchell Hamline School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. She told us earlier today that it's snowing out there. She's also co-president of Community Mediation Minnesota, and she serves on the boards of the Institute for the Study of Conflict Transformation, which is very dear to me, and Community Mediation and Restorative Services. She came to Minnesota from Florida, where she held a number of offices and served in many capacities. She was the ACR's representative to the drafting committee for the model standards of conduct for mediators, which was adopted by AAA, ABA, and ACR several years ago. Her cohort is Ellen Deason, who's the Joanne Wharton Murphy classes of, this is a long one, <laughs> Joanne Wharton Murphy, classes of 1965 and 73, professor in law emerita at Ohio State <coughs> uh, Moritz College of Law in Columbus, Ohio, where she taught mediation, international commercial arbitration and mediation, civil procedure and other dispute resolution courses. She currently serves as reporter for two uniform law commission committees that are related to dispute resolution and litigation. Um, the reason why these two women from Ohio and Minnesota are here together is because they're co-authors of a book called Mediation, Embedded Assumptions of Whiteness. And that's why we brought them in today. So take it away, Sharon and Ellen. Well, thank you very much for that um, generous introduction. I'm going to start us off if Sharon's going to share her screen um, with you. Um, thanks to Maria for inviting us. Um, and uh, thanks to this dynamic group for coming today. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about how this um, paper came to be. Ellen, can, can I interrupt for one second and just sure. say, um, like in terms of how we would like for you, we, we welcome your interaction yeah. with us and we are so excited to be with a group of practitioners who are active and who, are, who have things to add. Um, Ellen's gonna describe where we are in our process. And I did just wanna make one slight correction to what Julie said. We didn't write a book, we wrote an article. <laughs> um, maybe one day it'll become a book, but right now it's just an article. Um, with your help, maybe we can develop further along those lines. Um, but if you, would, if you have things, we really do want this to be interactive. So if you have things that you want to add, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom because that will pop you to the front screen. And in the participant list, we'll be able to see who has raised the hand. It also will keep the queue for us. Um, so please do feel free to do that. We also will try to monitor the chat. Um, but I think that's going to be a little bit more challenging just given the, the multiple screens and the multiple people um, who are here. So with that, I, I toss it back to Ellen. And then I'll say just a couple more words when I, when I talk about how happy I am to be with all of you. Great. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, yeah, the hand raising part is important. And we, we do welcome your participation. Um, our plan is to is to um, prompt you with a couple of at a couple of places as we go along with some questions, but also hope for a round table time for at the end for a round table um, where everyone can contribute. So, um, how did this paper come to be? Um, like many people, Sharon and I were both very upset after the George Floyd murder. Um, and that was a motivation for us to join a group. We, we, uh, there was an open invitation to dispute resolution colleagues um, to form some groups to discuss the book by Layla Said 
It's called Me and White Supremacy. Um, and it has challenges week and weekly exercises, reflections that she really lays down uh, for white people. And so our, our group met weekly uh, with discussions and the two of us um, ex expanded this um, from our personal lives into our prof the professional in the context of mediation. Um, and you know, the question arises, what are two white women doing writing about this? Um, we feel that as white people, it's our responsibility to grapple with the issue and not put this on um, people of color. People of color have been raising these issues for some time. And I think we feel we need to own our supremacy and, and take the lead in trying to do something about it. So our intent is to explore systematic issues. Um, we think that implicit bias on the part of a mediator um, is an important part of the picture. It's probably one that this group has grappled with um, before, but we're, um, we're attempting to broaden the lens. And so, for example, in our paper, we look at diversity among mediators, which is certainly a, a systematic problem. Um, but today we would like to focus on really what happens at the table um, in a typical mediation. Now you note the um, question marks. Do we mean systematic or systemic? We mean we mean systemic, I guess, and, and systematic. Um, and I wanna point out those question marks because the spirit in which we come is in raising questions and, and really with some humility. Um, and I wanna start with the idea that our examination comes, it's not limited to prejudice and, and discrimination. That, that a really important starting place is the realization that um, we all have an ingrained assumption in our culture that the white way of being is the normal way of being human. And that the white way tends to determine what's correct and what's acceptable. And so we tried to think about to what extent is that attitude, um, does that show up? Is that embedded in mediation? Um, does it, and, and we think that in some ways, for some people, it may permeate the field and, and the practice. So, the, so our next phase is to ask, so, so what happens next? And what, what our plan is today is, is to lay out the concepts in our article we ask every, excuse me, can we ask everyone to mute themselves? Thank you, I'm sorry, Ellen. That's okay, it's a, it's a Zoom problem, right? Um, so we, we plan to kind of lay out um, some of the basics in our article, um, interrupted with discussion, um, but where we would like to go next with our writing is to explore what are the implications if you agree with these implications, what are they? Uh, what are the implications from a practice standpoint? And so we're really looking forward to having discussion with with you, um, and could, because we want to learn from you. And so uh, let me let's see. We give an overview of the topics, and then turn it over to Sharon. So. This is using the terminology and the structure from the Sayed book. And um, we would, we're gonna start with mediation and tone policing, mediation and colorblindness, then mediation and white superiority. Then we're going to suggest that there are some mediation values that can help with this anti-racist work and um, the suggestions that we have come up with before, and then uh, have a roundtable discussion. And I wanna repeat that um, we hope that people will um, join in as we go along as well. And we're, we're sort of flexible with this structure. So 
Sharon and tone policing. Sorry, I have I have two screens going and I couldn't find my mouse to unmute myself. So um, I, I just can't resist saying a couple of words of just how delighted I am to be with all of you and how excited I was when Maria um, extended the invitation on behalf of uh, the, the planning committee. Um, you know, I, I put in the chat that I grew up in uh, New York on Long Island, and um, I lived there for really a you know extensive part of my my growing up. So I grew up believing and um, that New York was the biggest, the best at at everything, um, and it's definitely where I cut my teeth. Um, I did leave for a period of time to go to Florida, more years than I care. I, I I'm I'm sort of upset with Marie and Julie for. Um, outing me for my age, um, because I still don't kind of relate to that. Um, but it is, um, you know, I have always continued to stay very um, much watching New York, involved with New York. And so it's just such a pleasure to be with all of you. And I really salute um, Maria and the, all of the folks who have put this together over these many, many years. Um, what an incredible gift to gather together um, on a regular basis, such a, a robust group of people. So we really are excited about um, having time for, for conversation with all of you. So with that, let me, let me um, jump forward to talking a little bit more substantively. Um, so what is tone policing? Well, um, and, and let me just say that, that um, you know, this, this notion of white superiority, I know that for some people is, is a trigger. Uh, and, and for some of us who are white, we, we say, well, look, you know, we don't, we're not part of any white supremacist group. We don't, you know, believe in, in that kind of thing. So well, the way we're using that term and the way that Leila Assad puts it out there, it's more about this notion that, um, the white way is the right way. And that we swim in a culture um, where that is, if you look around, it's much more prevalent than I think any of us really allowed ourselves to think about. Certainly that was true for myself um, and why I'm so grateful for the group that gathered together with this um, to talk through Leila Saad's uh, book and to, to really take that deep examination of what is, what are the ways we show up in this world? So what, what Layla, this is a definition straight from um, her book. What she says is it's a tactic used by those who have privilege to silence those who do not by focusing on the tone of what is being said rather than the actual uh, content. So, um, you know, she gave examples of um, things that happened at conferences for to her and colleagues where people would say, well, you know, if you could just say that a little bit um, differently in a softer way, maybe we could hear you better. Um, that's the kind of thing that focuses not on the content, but, but suggests to someone that what they have to say has to be said in a way that, that we can hear it. And for me, when, when I got to this part in the book, I started thinking not only about my personal engagement in the world, but my professional engagement. And for me, I have very much always had my, my mediator hat and my mediation philosophy very much a part of who I am and how I show up in the world. And so I... Um, started thinking about, well, how was I trained as a mediator? And what are the ways that in mediation, we may be inadvertently doing this kind of tone policing? So where does it show up? First of all, communication around ground rules. Now, Interestingly, as Ellen and I have done a few of these presentations, this is something that's really concrete that a lot of people like latch right onto and they like, oh yeah, I can change that. And we think that that's a part, but we don't wanna get stuck here. But let me just say um, uh, 
to that that this this notion on ground rules is certainly when, when I took training as a mediator, I was taught that a mediator gives an opening statement and that a mediator sets out some expectations around what's going to happen, how that mediation process will flow. Um, and, um, oh, and, and I just want to note in the, uh, that Pierre, um, I will not try to murder your, your last name, and I'll just stay with Pierre, um, makes in the comment that um, the analysis is not university, universal, but applies uniquely American historical context, uh, does not apply to other countries or mediation in other countries. And I absolutely um, welcome that I don't know that answer. And so I trust Pierre that in, in your context that this is, that you're saying it doesn't apply. And so I appreciate your, your raising um, that issue. So it definitely Layla was writing from the, you know, a US perspective. And certainly the analysis that Ellen and I did was really thinking about it um, in that context. And we'll welcome I, uh, further thoughts on that. So um, what are some of those ground rules? Well, um, the idea that one person speaks at a time without interruption. Uh, the idea that we treat each other in this space with respect. Um, that the idea that only one person may be per side, if you have multiple people who show up, will speak on behalf. Now. I also want to highlight and recognize here that there are many different perspectives on mediation and people practice from different perspectives. And later on in the article, Ellen and I suggest that there are some um, practices or um, perspectives on the practice of mediation that are less likely to fall into some of these traps. And um, so this is not to say that Everybody does these exact kinds of things, but it's, it's really raising up for you. Where are those sort of even unspoken expectations that you walk into that mediation room and you carry with you about what, how people are going to relate to each other? So what's the, what's the harm with that? Well, Importantly, what we think the harm is that it could be stifling people's authentic voice by dictating how they communicate. So consider for a moment, I'm mediating and there are two people who enter into that mediation. Let's say whatever race, ethnicity they are, they are very comfortable and very used to being speaking in a way, communicating in a way that they talk over each other, that they um, interrupt each other, that they um, talk loudly to each other. Is it appropriate for me to dictate to them? You know, in this space, you have, you have to communicate so it's comfortable for me, the mediator. I mean, I think that, you know, that's a, that's a pretty extreme example, but I don't think it's... Um, all that unusual in a mediation for us subtly to give a message that how people are to communicate is in a way that's comfortable for the mediator. Um, I also want to suggest that um, specifically for BIPOC, and, and we do use that term um, Black, Indigenous, People of Color as a, a short way of describing sort of the, the group that we were particularly concerned about. Imagine if there is somebody who comes from a community and the issue is dealing with a dispute that has racism as part of the issue. And as mediators, we insist that they speak in an approved tone. What that does is it conveys the idea that 
the white ideas are superior to them. And it's very closely related to the second bullet point up here, this, this control of expressions of anger. Now, why do we do that as mediators? Well, we do that as mediators because we have an idea in our minds that one of our roles is to help people to hear each other. And for many of us, we were taught that the best way for someone to be able to hear the other person is for us to do some way of uh, managing it so that people can hear. And we'll, we'll say a little bit more about this, you know, also in terms of the idea of reframing. But, but here I just want to talk about the, the idea of tone on this. Um, and so this, this anger may be something that, that needs to be expressed and needs to be expressed in an authentic way. And by our um, sort of dictating that could put people um, in, an, in a position such that they don't feel that they can speak in their authentic voice. Um, and and Saad made this very interesting observation that, that Ellen and I really appreciated where she said that a white person's expression of anger is often seen as righteous, whereas a black person's anger is seen as aggressive and dangerous. This also connects, remember, to the disproportionality of who are mediators currently. Um, and so, you know, again, we are most comfortable in the, the ways that are most comfortable and familiar to us. So I just wanna make one other observation on, on this slide. And if I can get my mouse to go back over to that and advance it, um, seems totally to have lost it, but well, okay. Well, I'll, I'll get it eventually, but the question is about around respect. And, um, don't know how many of you, you know, use that in your openings. How many of you suggest that um, people treat each other with respect? So Ellen and I raised that as um, sort of a red flag because respect is in, in inherently an ambiguous term that perhaps has cultural overtones. What does respect mean? How does it manifest itself? So what has happened since the publication of our article is that um, Ellen and I have had some fabulous conversations with uh, a, uh, our new um, best colleague on, on this subject, Isabel Gunning. And Isabel Gunning has been writing in this area, you know, way before Ellen and I. Um, she is a um, African-American female law professor and um, steeped in this field. So this is her, her area. And she took us on on this notion. And I want to just read you a paragraph from an article that she has coming out that partially um, responds to some of the things that Ellen and I wrote and then you know, goes a step further in, in talking about community. Um, and here's what she says. So another aspect to concern on tone policing or any rules on communication is the concern over asking or requiring that the parties speak with respect. The fact that respect has cultural dimensions and variations is true. On the other hand, for Black Americans, with our history of enslavement and the indignities and lack of respect that the ugly and brutal history has meant from the time of slavery until now, through the perpetration, uh, the, uh, perpetration of white supremacy, a process that does not imagine that a Black party would or should be respected also creates problems. For Black Americans, respect is a key issue. So I wanted to um, suggest to you that this is more complicated. Um, and so with that, I wanted to open it up and to ask for, for all of you, either in the chat or in raised hands. Sharon, be before you do that, could I tell um, a short story that sort of draws the contrast there? Sure. Um, so when I think, when I hear the, um, the quote from Isabel's article, I think of the context of a white party in mediation who's spewing racist slurs and not respecting the, the black, the other party who may be black. 
Um, but I think that respect can also show up in the act of tone policing. Um, and this story is from an arbitration, but um, the arbitrator was talking about a, um, a phone arbitration with someone she assumed was an elderly black woman who was a consumer. And the woman accused the other person of lying. Um, and so the, the arbitrator just shut her down and said, no one lie, no one accuses anyone of lying in my arbitrations. And um, you know, we're not going to behave that way. Um, and the 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 session ended. And the black woman wrote a very impassioned email saying he was lying. And by telling me I couldn't say that, you were not respecting me. I'm an elderly person. Um, I tell the truth and, and you need to give me the respect to allow me to say that. So I guess that's a counter, um, not saying one is right and one is wrong, but that this is very complicated and that there's a, um, a context here. Now let me send it back to you, Sharon, for the prompting to our audience. Yeah, and I also just got an opportunity to scroll back uh, a little bit through the chat and um, want to uh, um, specifically lift up uh, Colonel Pratt, um, what um, what he wrote in the in the chat about encouraging folks to get insight from people of color in their own context, U.S. or elsewhere, to find out whether and how white supremacy might show up in their experience. And and um, you know, I, I really. Um, support the comment and also want to um, highlight that for us in, um, in, and this has always been a, a, you know, a slight bit of discomfort that we have as white women being the ones to talk about these things, but also feeling very much that it is our obligation to be doing the work and not relying on our colleagues of color to doing the work for us. Um, and so I, I, I really support this notion of it, this being in partnership with, um, not saying this is for you to tell us what it is we need to know and what it is we need to do. Um, so um, with that, we're interested in what, what do you think about this, this term of respect? What does respect mean in the context of mediation. Oh yeah, so really interesting, Ellen. Thanks for the uh, that uh, example in the in the chat around um, this the hearings around the the Supreme Court confirmations. Um, Brett Kavanaugh was able to express his anger and completely accepted. Uh, Katanji Jackson was. Um, not afforded the same kind of um, ability and um, really, you know, what would have happened had, had she expressed that same kind of response? Great example. Yeah, Laura. Hi, thanks. So um, I personally never ask the parties to respect me or anybody else in the mediation. I feel like that's not necessarily their responsibility in that context. Um, I do ask, we, we do all our services on Zoom and you might know if two people talk at the same time, nobody's heard. So I do make that very clear, um, but that's more as like a limitation of the forum. I just, I don't think it's uh, necessarily appropriate to demand the parties respect each other when they're there to solve a conflict. Thanks, Laura. Anybody else? All right, so um, Bianda, is that, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correct, uh, says instead of asking folks um, about respect, maybe we define the specific ways we're asking folks to treat each other. Okay, so, so taking out some of that ambiguity. So like, you know, what is it that we are asking? Um, and again, so this question, so what does that mean if you, you know, focus on the non-interruption, but keep it with, I can't hear if, if people are, are interrupting, talking over each other. And certainly I think, Laura, your, your point, as we move to remote 
um, mediations, there are limitations to when when people are speaking at the at the same time, and it it uh, allows for us to insert that maybe in a way that that is less uh, problematic. Um, is that they? Is that they who I know from uh, Mitchell Hamlin? That's me, Sharon. How are you? Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, would avoiding the assumptions, um, uh, could one avoid the assumption by simply asking the question? Um, for instance, if a mediator was inclined to set a ground rule that we respect each other, could, could it be culturally sensitive to ask, um, what would respect look like in this conversation for, for us? and then allow that to be defined by, um, you know, the parties. Yeah, so yeah. This, this, this idea of, of um, giving back to the people who are at mediation, the ability to shape the, the conversation in ways that make sense for them, um, you know, definitely is something that that we we came to. And while you know, spoiler alert, if you haven't read the article, um, that that we actually lift up um, transformative and inclusive mediation for those very reasons of of putting giving a lot back um, and really preferencing. Um, what it is that, that folks want out of the mediation and how do they want to. So it's not a matter of what I want, it's what, what do you want? How, how's this gonna work for you? Thanks, Faye. Um, and then um, I, I, Andrew put into the chat and then I'll get to you, Chris, um, that, it's, that respect is complicated. Three different meanings, human dignity, admiration and deference to status. Um, and, and then that, that third meaning is the one we need to be most mindful of in hierarchies of racial power. And I think that that's, that's right. So that because there are these, you know, different ways and it, it, it triggers in each of our minds a different sense of what it does that mean, it becomes a more challenging to do. Um, and, uh, okay, so Chris, and then... Uh, Oh boy, Bithabali, you're gonna to have to help me on that, that name. So Chris. Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, my comments are similar to what the gentleman just said and what you read from uh, the chat, is that when a mediator tends to say, let's center respect in this conversation, I think that that has way more to do with the comfort of that mediator and that mediator's power. It is not uh, honoring the self-determination of the parties. And it's not uh, creating a process for the parties, but instead it's really centering that top down power and that discomfort that that mediator might have individually of what's going on in front of them. So just, you know, that's my perspective on it. It's really not creating a quality process for the parties within that dialogue. It's, uh, it's really trying to import their own sort of uh, comfort and strictures on that conversation. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, so help me with your name. Batabile. Batabile, thank yes. you. Batabile, yes. Um, so having, you know, I have not read the article, of course, I feel like I'm coming and talking without having first done the homework. But um, there are a, a couple of things that you may have covered um, that I would like to comment on that are sort of more overarching. Um, one, I've been very, like a lot of people, I've been heartened by the response um, that has uh, evolved since um, George Floyd was murdered. Um, you know, the interest and, and enthusiasm and um, uh, dedication, you know, to learning about um, white superiority and racism and uh, and so forth. But I also get concerned sometimes that certain ways of being as a white person um, get reinforced in within the desire, um, you know, to do the work. Um, and so, while it is important, I think, for white people to do the work and not to necessarily impose on you know the first black person they know um, and so forth it also is something that cannot be done without guidance 
from BIPOC. Um, and so, you know, I get concerned that this tendency, which I think is embedded, not necessarily only in um, Western uh, cultures, um, and I'm being very broad and, you know, uh, and I feel, you know, bad about not being able to be more specific in that way, but this um, concept of, of um, expertise, you know, um, and authority. Uh, I see now, you know, two years later, people who have read some books and perhaps attended some workshops wanting to come and tell us what racism is <laughs> um, and what it is not. Um, and so, you know, I would really highly encourage folks who want to include, you know, cultural um, competency, sensitivity, you know, whatever it is into their mediation practice um, to understand that you know, one of the things that people of, of BIPOC have been trying to say is we are very different. Um, you know, we're as, as, as diverse internally as externally. And so one cannot assume that because a black person walks into the room, this is what respect is going to look like. Um, and so, as you know, you allude to that in the article, you talk about asking uh, and so forth, uh, and then having an open mind to accept the authority, uh, the expertise of that person on their own understanding of what is necessary for themselves. I, as a mediator, um, believe in the one person speaks at a time um, for reasons that are about psychology and about, um, you know, uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> um, you know, how thought processes work. Um, and so that is more about technique than it is about my own comfort, right? It's about what I've found to work in 17 years as a mediator. Um, so I, it's, it's something I'm still thinking through. I appreciate you giving me this time to, to you know, talk and think as I talk. Um, but I, I really do have some concerns about what has happened in terms of power, authority, expertise, and you know, what white folk have been used to and how it gets re-expressed um, even though the intent is really good. Thank you so much for those incredibly insightful and helpful comments. And um, I, um, I couldn't help but, but feel like there was um, some aspect of tone policing going on even for you because you were incredibly gentle in, your, in how you expressed some of what um, I can only imagine is tremendous frustration in, um, in sort of what has happened in those intervening, in this intervening years. Um, and, and just really appreciate the, the remind, first of all, you're speaking out and speaking up um, and, and the, the reminder that, um, you know, it, it is, you know, as Ellen said uh, to start this, I mean, the reason our article includes those question marks, our articles, it, it's not just this presentation, the article has the question mark because we, we truly do not, we raise questions. I, we don't have the answers. And, and I absolutely um, appreciate and, and hope that um, it's one of the things, reasons why we have loved our partnership and our conversations with Isabel, um, because um, I don't think we can do this alone. You know, I think we need to be doing this in partnership. So thank you so much for, um, for all that, that you've, you've added to the conversation. Um, Janice. Can I just add, me. because oh, um, this touched me as well. Um, I, think, I think that this group here and the discussion today is a perfect example of the kind of thing that, that we were hoping for in, in explicitly making our, our ideas questions. Um, because we we know that we don't know, and and so really the, you know, if we can play some small role in opening up um, a space for discussions um, that aren't just by white people, um, that's really our hope. So and so I, but I also want to thank you very much for saying what you said, and I guess it's Janice's turn. 
You're on mute, Janice. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> I'm so excited to join in. Uh, I did read your article, by the way. Um, and I'll talk more about that later when we do the round table. Uh, and Batabale, uh, yes, I uh, concur with what you raised and applaud you for doing that. I want to get back to the tone policing, um, if I may. And um, one of the things that we need to be especially careful about when we are um, uh, facilitating a, um, a discussion and conversation and, and resolution between participants is how we even think about the process of ground rules. Um, it's important to understand for, for instance, for black people in the United States, just the word ground rule, just the word rule is a trigger because we have lived, our experience has been there's one set of rules for white people, there's another set of rules for black and brown people and indigenous people. And that's been our life experience. So just hearing the word, but it goes back even further for us, the, the challenge for us as mediators is if we're even thinking in terms of rules, how that, the, the implication that will have on how we interact with the participants. So even if we say, well, I will use another word, but if we're thinking rules, the effect will be the same. And the mediator, you know, the whole thing can go askew, can go awry, and you're wondering why uh, certain people aren't participating or certain people are getting angry and frustrated in the process and not even have a clue that a simple thought in the mediator about rules can just be like putting a hat, throwing a hand grenade in the middle of what's already a conflict. Thank you, Janice. Appreciate it. Um, Tianda, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, let, let's maybe make this the last comment on this one so that we could, because so, I, now I understand some of you are holding back for the round table and I wanna make sure that we save time to get to the round table. So um, is it Tianda? Tianda, the H Tyanda. is silent. I get it all the time. Um, okay. Don't feel bad. Um, I just wanted to say there's something to telling people how to behave and like when we come in as mediators and define that without one for the individuals understanding what respect means to them right because if we're asking them to respect each other that's based on our own definition. Um, so there's no space for their own individual definitions, but they also already have a prior relationship. And so we don't know <laughs> what that is. We don't know how they communicate. Some people are very comfortable communicating with loud voices. Some people are not. Um, I've often seen, <laughs> um, you know, folks as the mediator be really uncomfortable with folks having raised voices. And I think that's something that is really important when we're setting up those ground rules. Honestly, I try to have as few rules about how the participants should engage as possible and let them show up as authentically and as things arise then engage with them based on that um, and if, it, if there's a problem you know stopping and addressing the problem then but if they're comfortable engaging with each other in that particular way and are able to begin working through the issues sometimes they need to let the steam out of the bag right and so um, I just wanted to throw that out there because then we don't have that problem of, are we putting our expectations on other people? We're opening it up for them to show up as they are, which is really what we want them to be able to do, to be able to work through their issue. Thank you. Perfect, perfect um, last comment for this, this segment. And I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, Ellen's going to talk a little bit about the, the, another concept on a colorblindness. You're on mute, Ellen. I think I'm now unmuted. Um, this, the, the tyranny of Zoom. Um, so a second aspect of, of whiteness um, that Syed introduced, she calls color blindness. Um, and I think that, you know, for many of us, that sounds innocuous, or it may even remind us of 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s goal, um, hoping that um, for a day when, quote, people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, and that uh, this can often be confused with colorblindness. It's obviously wrong uh, as a literal matter. Um, so what people are really saying when, when they don't see color um, is that they don't treat people differently um, based on race. Um, and that's just not true. Um, and we're certainly not there as a society. Um, and so we think, um, we agree with, with uh, Leila Syed that, that this probably has the impact of, of erasing the BIPOC experience. Um, and, and what she uh, refers to this is as a particularly insidious way for people with white privilege to pretend that their privilege is fictitious by not recognizing the difference. And so it just denies all those differences that people have experienced. Um, and so I see in the comment, it's a form of gaslighting. Uh, I only recently learned what that term means. It seems to have lots of applications. Um, and so we see, we, we hypothesize that colorblindness shows up in mediation in a number of different ways um, that are on the next slide. Sharon's multitasking, reading the chat, advancing the slides. Um, so, and we're gonna talk about the ones in bold to the extent we have time. Um, we think we have identified these four interrelated areas where, where it potentially shows up in some mediations. Um, blindness to life exp experiences and the differences in life experiences. Blindness of the mediator through racist stereotypes, um, likely in the form of implicit bias. Um, we're assuming that you're familiar with implicit bias and you've probably already talked about it. Um, we can bring it up in the later discussion if, if you'd like. We also see an effect of neutrality here um, in blindness coupled with white silence where a white mediator um, may recognize that there's bias being expressed, bias being exhibited, but they feel that they can't intervene because of the principles of neutrality, uh, leading it to white silence, which is being complicit without taking action. Um, and then we also see forms of blindness due to what we're calling Western Eurocentric cultural um, assumptions. So, so uh, let me put it to Sharon to talk a little bit about ways in which we think that mediation may be blind or pro promoting blindness to a life experience or what could be felt like a participant as a blindness to their life experience. Yeah, and I'm going to go through these a bit quickly so that we can make sure that we save time for the, the roundtable and we're happy to go back and, and sort of um, delve in a little bit deeper on, on any or all of them. <clears throat> but again, this blindness to life experience, the places where we at least identified that it, that it could be showing up in a mediation is in this idea, and I, I, I sort of foreshadowed it a little bit around reframing. So, you know, one of the things that as mediators, many of us were taught to do is to take a um, emotionally charged statement and say it in another way that may be easier for the other person to hear and therefore understand. So there's a, there's a, a reason why we, we do that. On the other hand, if you think about it from this notion of blindness to life experience, reframing could have the impact of diminishing, of taking away the emotional heat that somebody feels in what they have said. And as mediators, are we doing, you know, did, in, does our um, doing that again insert and, and assert this notion that 
We have to take what somebody's life lived experiences, how it has impacted them, the anger, the hurt, the whatever that they feel, and make it palatable so that it's acceptable to, let's say, the dominant culture, the white culture um, on that. Um, I also want to recognize and just I'll lift up, but again, maybe we can come back and talk about this in, in the round table, is context matters. And so, you know, a, a further thought that Ellen and I um, have had is, well, what about when um, reframing happens in the context of caucus? mediations, of those mediations when people are not face-to-face. -face. And I recognize in this group that, that of the 145 people who are here, there, there probably are a range of contexts that you work. You know, some of you in schools, some of you with um, divorce mediation, some of you in large civil cases, some of you in community. Different contexts, different styles of mediations, and then different ways of approaching that. Um, full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of and don't really understand pure caucus style mediation, but I know it's done. And it, and it occurred to me that reframing in front of the person who has said it is very different potentially than reframing when they're not in the room. I'm not sure which is better or worse, mind you. I'm just saying different. And so I'm, I'm just sort of uh, scratching my head on that one and, and thinking more about it. Another aspect of this is the is it possible question. Again, different mediators, we've been trained differently. Facilitative mediation, um, I would feel pretty confident saying that many of us were taught that there are things that a mediator can do to help to um, promote people thinking about it in a different way. And a favorite way of doing that is the, is it possible question? Is it possible that it wasn't racism, but it was just somebody having a bad day? Now, in the abstract, it doesn't sound like a terrible thing because inevitably, at least how I was taught, when you ask an is it possible question, inevitably the answer is, yeah, it's possible. I don't believe that to be true, but it's possible. And as soon as somebody indicates it's possible, they're no longer as stuck where they were. But again, does that undermine somebody's experience of it? Does it then signal to them, okay, it's not okay for you to think that that was racism. What you need to do is think that it's something else. Again, question, these are questions. The forward-looking focus. Um, there have been lots written about this by scholars way before Ellen and I, including uh, Trina Grio, um, around women, particularly around divorce context, of this notion of it doesn't matter what happened previously. All that matters is what do you want it to look like going forward. That's a form of erasure of what experience you have had, someone has had. So. The, the last like piece I'll put in on this um, is that we know from research that mediators shape the narrative in a mediation to emphasize the options they favor, often because they judge them the most likely lead to lead to an agreement. So with a white mediator, the white narrative is likely to be that place of comfort. And so that becomes, again, a question for us as to, is this is what, what is happening? Um, and when we get to the round table, we will be interested in hearing from all of you what practices you've seen potentially or identify as having that effect of erasure. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Ellen for um, this, a little bit more on the neutrality question. <laughs> Okay, so a lot, lots of interesting things coming up in the chat that I'm going to ignore for now um, and, and move on to the idea of, of white silence um, being the way that many people stay silent about racism. And for many people, it might be born of discomfort with the subject, uh, white fragility, 
is the, one of the terms used now. I think someone needs to mute themselves or getting a, sounds like a, a delicious breakfast on the, <laughs> um, but what happens is that this serves the status quo. And so you can think of it as a, a way of holding on to one's white privilege through inaction. Um, and certainly uh, anti-racist work is going to need action and not just um, sitting on the sides and, and observing. So from our point of view, we think that this can actually flow from one of the foundational values of mediation, that being um, neutrality or impartiality, um, which in practice, for, in terms of practice, some people will interpret this as a command that the, the mediator is going to be very even handed, treat the parties equidistantly, um, and that it's inconsistent with intervening. Let's say a participant is expressing a microaggression or something um, overtly racist. Um, and, and so if it's neutrality in the process, um, you know, you want to avoid having one party not trust you by seeing that you're thinking that you're siding with the other party. Um, it can be interpreted as a, as a you can't intervene. Um, it also takes the, 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 the form of a outcome neutrality. And there's lots of debate in the field. Is this desirable? Is this even possible? Don't we all have some views um, about the, the outcome? Um, but our question is, you know, does this promote this idea of outcome neutrality? Does it promote white silence in a way that brings up neutrality and makes it more important than say fairness and justice, equity, um, or perhaps in some cases even self-determination. Um, and we've had some wonderful conversations with Maurice Robinson, um, who's here in New York City. Um, and and he, what he stressed was, it's not enough to be non-racist, that, that anti-racism is a verb and that it's defined by what actions that you take. And so um, he sees the idea of not intervening at all um, as, as being inconsistent with this, that an active role means you have to speak out, um, but that you know, this is subject to criticism, inconsistent with neutrality, um, can be seen as a way of the mediator co-opting opportunities for the parties to express their feelings about what's being said. Um, and so um, we'd like to ask the question of you here, to what extent do you think a mediator can take on the role of, of being an, anti-racist? Um, can you as a mediator um, inject that value? And in your experience, have you, have you seen situations where you felt the need to inject a value of, of anti-racism into the mediation. Um, Ellen, so do you wanna, do you wanna just plant that seed for that question and let's just do the next slide on the, um, on the Western cultural assumptions and then open it all up? Great, that's a great idea. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do um, this, just this next slide, which is, which actually ties very much into this concept of neutrality. So, um, and I think somebody, and I can't remember who said it, that uh, made the observation that there are, it, it's not just the United States, it's sort of, there's a, there are Western uh, cultural assumptions. Um, and certainly any of you who have done comparative studies around mediation know that this um, idea of neutrality is very much a Western concept that in many, many other cultures, um, the idea of who you would go to to assist with a dispute is you would never go to someone who doesn't know anything or any about you or the situation, that, that you would go to a trusted person in the community. And that trusted person is someone who knows you and knows the community. So just putting square on the table, this, this whole idea really about neutrality. It also brings up 
who's at the table. Um, again, many of you probably have studied a lot of this, but um, dominant culture here suggests that we are an individualistic society. Um, and um, what that means is that we are very much about the individual making decisions that are, uh, that are best for the individual. Um, that also is not true across all cultures. Um, and so some cultures are more collectivist in their thinking. And so they would never reach a mediation agreement without thinking about the impact that it has on all of the members of their immediate family or their clan or their community. And so this question about who we say gets to be at the table, who is a decision maker, those also are embedded with assumptions. And then there's a whole lot that has been um, written around negotiation norms. And uh, Maria was part of um, a project that we did at uh, Mitchell Hamlin, actually before we were Mitchell Hamlin, on rethinking negotiation teaching. And there's a great article, and I'll, I'll get it to all of you, around what are all of those assumptions that are baked into negotiation um, that then get lifted into and placed in the context of mediation, because very often mediation is described, defined as the um, negotiation in the presence of a neutral third person who's there to assist with it. Uh, and then the last piece, and I'm going through these really, really um, quickly here, is just this question that we want to put out there. Um, it's come up in some of what you all have said around is self-determination, is a focus on self-determination, would that help us um, to overcome some of these other barriers and some of these other things that uh, we are raising? Um, and with that, um, I am going to stop the share and um, we've got about, uh, I guess, 24 minutes for open um, round table. Um, and Vey, you wanna start us out? Yes, and I have to uh, sort of give a, a disclaimer because I, what I'm going to say is a, is a little bit of a critique um, because I was a little stunned um, that and a little sort of disappointed, not in your article, but in the fact that there could be a large number of mediators who don't have some orientation already uh, to a lot of what you have written and are saying. I mean, it, it is very disturbing um, to think <laughs> that that is even possible. Um, the other thing is that in some ways, your article and even your discussion reinforce some of those disturbing things because the fact that there that you can begin with a question of whether or not whiteness is embedded in mediation itself is a little off-putting because it must be uh, considered as a fact based upon all of the um, uh, resources, theories, and anecdotes and resources that you even used in your article. It is un indisputable. So to even question it seems to be addressed to white people who have not done the work they should have done to date and are yet in powerful positions. And I think mediator is in a powerful position, even if we try to deny it, um, to influence people's lives. And, it's that, and so when you ask, if you just asked a question, Ellen asked a question before you um, asked her to go to the next slide, a question where the answer is foregone. The conclusion is already, <laughs> There, so so it's almost as like coddling white people into a conversation that makes them feel uncomfortable, but at the same time giving them an out to continue to raise questions for which they must be held accountable for before they begin to influence people's lives at the table. That to me is like I, you know I I really appreciate the work and the and the article discussion, everything. But those disturbing elements, I think must be said. One last one that I'll land on when, in your conversation about colorblindness. So, you know, as, as a legal scholar and a legal professor, professors, I, you know, you announced at the beginning that you're not critical race theorists. 
And I would say, because of the, the, the uh, writing and the scholarship in critical race theory from Patricia Williams, 1995, Rooster's Egg, and others lay out this notion of colored blindness and critique it um, quite, uh, you know, deliberately, eloquently, and diligently. Uh, so my thing was, why did you and Ellen not start farther? Why, why is it so much of the questions, so much of going back for, to things that, you know, it's like, really? Now, I, I mean, I know that it's needed. <laughs> I know that it's needed. But I, that's one question. The other question is, why not include more autoethnography? Why not include more self-reflective uh, on how this impacted your practice? When you look at this and look back on what you have done as white women, you know, how have you negotiated these things uh, over the long course? That's absent because you take an objective stance and you take one here as well that doesn't situate your white experience. Mm -hmm. And that is what is to me, I wanna know. I wanna know as two white women, um, and I know Sharon well, well somewhat well, I mean, I was in your program <laughs> at Mitchell Penland. Uh, and, I, you know, and I know the wonderful work that you do and I know how you train students uh, and, and things like that. But I want to know from a person of your stature about this grappling. And that is what, you know, I'm still looking for uh, because that is what the mediators must do. They, when you say that this isn't, that it, we must be self-reflective and expose gaps, expose faults, expose those things in order to move ahead, especially as race, uh, as white, people. So I'll just end there. So I'll start, Ellen, and then I'll, I'll, I'll toss to you. But um, Faye, thank you so much for, for being, um, for giving such an, an honest and frank critique. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, and I, and I think that I, I will just add one, you know, additional piece that, that has been somewhat of discomfort for Ellen and I, um, because we're not the first people to say this, we're not the first people to notice it, we're not the first people to write about it. And yet, and yet, because we wrote this piece, we actually have gotten a lot of invitations to talk about it. Is that right? Absolutely not. Why is it that Isabel Gunning isn't the one who has been receiving these kinds of uh, invitations over the course? And, and I can go on and on and name different names. So it's, it's, it's quite um, troubling that, that we are in this space. I, I, I appreciate the comments about um, that we weren't bolder um, and uh, certainly we'll take, take that in and figure out how to be bolder on it. And we'll just say one personal note is, um, since you asked, uh, that summer of reading the book, put me um, in a tailspin around rethinking everything that I was doing as a mediator and as someone and as a, and as a teacher of mediation um, and really going back to um, re-examining and and just deep reflection on what I was doing in the room, what I wasn't doing in the room, what should I be doing in the room, all of that. So um, Yes, it happened. I didn't write about it, but um, I appreciate being able to say that. Uh, Ellen, we'll go to you, and then I know Janice has a hand up. Thank you, and um, I want to echo everything Sharon said. I, I, I would like to, and I guess in some ways, maybe we were tone policing ourselves. Um, in, and someone else has described us as being gentle. Um, and I guess that part, maybe that goes with the territory, I'm not sure, um, but it is what it was. But in terms of um, the self-reflection on how has it affected my approach to mediation, um, I think it's a work in progress. And um, 
I, I actually a week ago um, gave a speech in which I tried to develop some ideas about um, equity as a being another um, principle that should be a pillar for our values in mediation, um, maybe competing with neutrality. Um, but and, and the idea of that several of you have have said and have said in the chat about consulting with the parties and treating people as individuals, um, looking for what's going to work for them, as opposed to just automatically imposing um, a certain pattern, a certain script that we've been been taught about how to approach mediation. I think you know that's that's really a step forward that that many people need to take in a sense going back to the original flexibility of mediation and and not just resorting to to habits that are white habits um, i'll stop there because we want to hear from you so uh, janice and then uh, tayanda and you're muted janice you got me so engaged, I forget to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, speaking of, to what you just said, Ellen, about the script we sometimes follow in, in the process of the mediation, one of the things that I found helpful through the years is to ask the participants what they hope will come out of this conversation, this mediation and then ask them after they've had a chance to talk to, to, to say those things, what are some of the things that might get in the way of that getting accomplished? Then they're telling you, they're te so they are developing it. So it's not the mediator imposing a structure or imposing guidelines, it, it's organic, it comes from them. And so it's a demonstration of respect from the get-go. It engages them from the get-go and it makes it clear that it's their process, not ours. That's not why my hand was raised, but Ellen prompted that. Uh, uh, first of all, I applaud you, uh, Sharon and Ellen, for stepping out there, okay? I know it couldn't be easy, but you had the guts and the courage to step out there with this article. Um, I read it. Lots of notations, post-its. <laughs> um, and um, for those of you who haven't read it, I certainly encourage you to read the article. It's pretty thorough. But it was also very painful for me. And I'm, let me tell you why. Um, the, the premise of embedded assumptions of whiteness. And I got so excited about that. And then I get into the first paragraph and I see the term that's been used even here today by different participants is BIPOC, which is an acronym for Black Indigenous People of Color and People of Color. And every time it came up in this article, something in me just cried out because the use of an acronym dehumanizes the people who are represented in that acronym. To give you an example, one, um, one sentence reads, while tone policing is a mechanism by which white people silence BIPOC, white silence describes the way that many white people stay silent about racism. It sets up this dualism because the white people are addressed as white people. Their humanity comes off the page. But the people who are black, indigenous, and other people of color, could, it could read robot, it could read widget. There's no humanity in it at all. And it was as if I was being stabbed every time it came up. It was painful. But the content 
of what you've written is excellent. And so that's, I bring that up as possibly an example of an embedded assumption that's integrated in this wonderful work unintentionally, unintentionally. So it challenges all of us, me too, to really be so reflective about every, every aspect of this. This isn't a one size fits all. And I know that the terms like that are used because in fact, Sharon, I think you said it earlier, it's um, a shortcut, a short way of saying, well, it's short for whom? It's for the convenience of whom? And who is it hurting? That's all I'm gonna say. Thank you, Janice. I, I put it in the chat, but I, I just want to say that I um, appreciate your um, bringing it to our attention. I think it, it, it absolutely uh, shows that we are absolutely still work in progress, not, not there. And um, truly, I'm sorry for the pain that that, that, that caused you. I mean, you, you were kind to say that it was unintentional. It was, but that doesn't forgive or excuse. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. You're very welcome and, and thank you. Uh, and it's something for all of us to think about, me included, because we live in a culture where we use acronyms a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. and we need to think about the, the impact it has. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dianda? Dianda. I'm gonna turn my camera on for this one. Thank you for saying that, Janice, first of all. I think the term BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color was specifically created to highlight the experiences of Black and Indigenous people. And so the way that we use it now actually ends up erasing the power <laughs> in which that term was created. And a lot of us are using it wrong. Um, I actually wanted to speak on this idea of neutrality. Um, and I will start with the disclaimer that my mediation focuses <laughs> all around um, incidents and conflict around identity and differences in, in identity. And I think it's very important not to be neutral in the face of bias and isms. And in my intro, I make a disclaimer about that so that folks understand that when those things come up, they will be addressed maybe not necessarily in the moment, depending on how they are handled. Um, but I, when you brought up the question, can you be anti-racist in the mediation process? I really am struggling to understand how we can actually have any kind of effective resolution without addressing these imbalances and power. How can someone who is being harmed by this power dynamic or whatever is happening actually be a full participant in the process if we are not addressing these challenges. And so, you know, for me, I make sure to address them. And that's why I created what I do because neutrality and the ideas that was taught to me does not allow for it. But I think it's so important. And I've seen in the mediations that I do, the healing that it creates for these people who often don't have a space to say anything about what is happening to them. They don't have the opportunity to share their pain in a way that they are actually being heard. And so just being heard alone, even if they can't reach resolution is so meaningful for them. And I've also seen white folks be able to learn in a much more meaningful way because they have actually finally gotten to hear that in a way that they actually are impacting someone versus this overall theoretical idea that they walk away with after attending a training or having a conversation without actually understanding what it looks like in their everyday life. So I really want to understand how we can be mediators without addressing these things. Thanks, Nanda. Um, in the interest of getting uh, the queue through, I, I won't comment on that, and, and we'll, we'll move on to uh, Colonel, uh, then Jesse, and then uh, Vitabali. So, um, what I love about this conversation is it's a perfect example of what Black folk have been saying all the time. We are not monolithic because there are some points that they made that I disagree with. 
Um, there are some points that Janice made that I disagree with. I don't mind the term BIPOC. I take pride in it, but that's me. And so that's just a prime example of how you cannot assume that just because someone's skin color is brown, they think about terms and things a different way. So um, I think the, the, the part for me being a, a brand new mediator, having gone through 70 hours of, of training with two different mediation um, centers is that your, your message and these important questions, um, I don't see them showing up in the way that the training is being designed. And so these mediation centers are pumping out mediators with the same assumptions. And when, when I raise these questions in the training, um, they're set to a side. You know, we'll, we'll put a pin in that. We'll get to it later. And they may or may not get to it. And so um, not, not only do practitioners need to constantly ask these critical questions about uh, their practice, but we need to get this message out to these training centers and, and mediation centers and, and help people understand, okay, we have to constantly reevaluate how we're training people to do this. Because if we're not, I don't expect that um, the, the mediation centers will be able to answer these questions all the time, but I hope that they will train people to ask the question of themselves, to be reflective and to, and to really look back at, you know, even if it's just the mediation I just completed, how did power show up? What did I do to empower? What did I do to, you know, you know, el eliminate power? What, what am I doing? You know, and, and how is that impacting people? What kind of feedback am I getting after each mediation to let me know whether or not I need to correct something? And, and I'm just telling you, after 70 hours, that's not showing up in, in the trainings that people are doing. Thanks, Colonel. Appreciate it. Jesse. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to speak to this question of being anti-racist as a mediator. And I agree so much with Tayanda that absolutely we must. Otherwise, I think we're betraying some of the fundamental principles uh, that brought us to, to practice mediation in the first place. But the, and the question for me is more how uh, and, and can, does our original toolbox of mediator tools can, can we use those or do we need different tools? Uh, and, and we might tweak something. We might tweak the concept of neutrality and, and say multi-partiality and maybe spend 70% of our time raising the voice of someone who hasn't, who hasn't been able to be heard. Um, so that, that's, I think, the use of a traditional mediator tool, but maybe we're reapplying it a little bit. Um, but, and you also, you asked, uh, but I'm, curi I'm curious to hear about other, other tools or whether we need new tools. Um, and you also asked an example of a time where we tried to be anti-racist in a mediation and, and something came up for me around mediation I did with a, a black woman in leadership and a white man who reported to her and, and, and she accused him of racism and he uh, was like a textbook white fragility and just he could not think about anything else and he couldn't listen to her and they were screaming and um, I I, I, I separated them and, and spoke with both of them separately. And, and, I, and this is where I think I treaded a line uh, in, in around like, my mediator neutrality, because I feel like I spent a little time teaching him um, and, and, and saying, you know, just because she said you're a racist doesn't mean she's saying you're the worst person in the world. And, and let's try to <laughs> calm down a little bit. I didn't tell him to calm down, but that, that was what I was going for. Um, you know, can, can the reality is that she has some complaints, some serious concerns about your behavior, and you're so upset about having been called racist that you're not able to hear those concerns. So are you, I can't do this mediation. <laughs> if, 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 if you can't listen, doesn't mean you have to agree with her. Um, you know, are you willing? And in the end, we got to a place where they could talk to each other. There was no resolution, but, <laughs> but they could at least, he could at least listen. Um, so, I don't know, that's just an example, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear others. Yeah, and I just want to note that we're, we're, get, we're running right up against the, the, the end time. So, um, Marie, is it okay if uh, Batabali and Sam say what they want to say, and then we close out? We can. Um, we usually have a firm 10 a.m. 
uh, adjournment, but we continue informally if you and Ellen are willing to hang around for a short while, just because we know people need to get to work and do whatever. So officially, I want to thank both of you for an incredibly stimulating, informative morning that uh, I'm sure everyone found refreshing and uh, cutting edge. Uh, we are moving in a very uh, different space. And I hope that this was um, one small step in moving forward. With that, um, we will stop the recording so that we will be officially uh, over. And um, for those of you who'd like to hang out, uh, we'll keep this open for a bit longer. And Ellen and Sharon, uh, you said that you were going to be available to hang around for a bit. Okay, that's what we usually do. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop the recording.